Welcome to our Safe and Sound Protocol podcast. And I thought we'd start with just each of you introducing yourself, uh, your background, whereabouts you are in the country, because we have listeners tuning in from all around the world, uh, and talk a little bit about your your main focus of your practice, because you all bring a, a unique perspective today. So I think it'll be nice to sort of share that knowledge in how you use the Safe and Sound Protocol. So maybe Kate would start with uh, Kate. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Kate Orman. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. I am the founder and CEO of Brain Train America. Uh, we're in Columbia, Maryland, um, but we do have clients from all over the United States and outside of the United States as well. Um, we are or one of a kind of brain gym for your brain. So a lot of times when people go to the gym, you see elite athletes, you see, um, you know, health, you see senior citizens, you see children, you see people recovering. Well, that's what, and so there's all different ages. We have all different ages at Brain Train. We have um, children through senior citizens, peak performance, academic, healthy aging. And we do also a lot of recovery work. Um, we do focus a lot on the auditory system and improving the auditory system. Um, we see that's a, a big weakness um, for those, um, and a lot of people don't even realize it. Um, so that's kind of our focus. And we, uh, since we do really look at improving the auditory system, we've been very much a, a provider and a, very happy with the ILS focus. So when SSP came along, we jumped on the bandwagon in 2016, and that's one of our tools. So we are, um, we really have seen a lot of success with it. Awesome, awesome. And we're going to be diving in so you can share some of those stories with us. Um, so Monica, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Monica Cochran and I'm located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and I have clients all over the world. Um, I'm an educator, so that's my lens on it. And I've been an educator for 40 some years now. So, but the last 25, I think I've really recognized the importance of safety in learning. And um, I work with what I call quirky learners. They're the kids that, you know, have, they're like the square pegs that fit in the round hole of one size fits all school. And so when I work with them, what I learned, you know, a couple decades ago is that what I was doing was giving them a safe enough container to be able to learn. And so Dr. Porges' work fit very well. I'm also a DIR, advanced practitioner. So I work with a lot of kids on the spectrum and, and adults. And I just found the same thing. I need to be able to find a way to get that serve and return in a, in a calm enough way that they can actually begin to learn. So like I said, when SSP came, it was like, whoa, this is really good. This accelerates that process for me. And I use it in a variety of ways with different clients. Because I work with, as Karen, I work with Kate, I work with young kids all the way up through adults. So it, how I use it depends on, you know, the client I'm working with. So mm -hmm. I'm excited. So, um, Monica, if you, if you could just say what DIR is for our oh, listeners, because yes. I'm sure that's what people will be like, oh, what is this? I'd like to know about it. This is um, Stanley Greenspan and Serena Readers, or two psychiatrists who um, founded this concept about, well, it's probably 35 years ago now. And basically it stands for Developmental Individual Differences and Relationship. And it's, um, it's an approach for working um, with people all over. We all use it, but it's been especially effective with kids on the spectrum. And um, then um, Dr. Mona Dalhuk book wrote a book and it really became much more you know, combining the work of Dr. Porges and Dr. Greenspan and Stuart Shanker, you know, a lot of people now. So it's, it's very, very much helps create that connection, that connection, that safety. Um, and then we can begin to move up levels of cognition and uh, emotional development. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if that was a good kind of a roundabout explanation, but I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Well, I know sometimes people sort of know the DIR as DIR floor time. So people probably correlate the floor time component, at least from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, they sort of understand the floor time component to the DIR. Um, and then I thank you for sharing that, that model because I think that is what is the beauty of the Safe and Sound Protocol. And I know you all are gonna, we're gonna go into that today about how you can actually embed that within, with our 
um, other therapy tools that we've you know accumulated in our you know over our time yeah, we're trying to help client clients very much we're just trying to expand it because when people hear floor time they tend to think of little children and being on the floor and the philosophy of floor time is joining in and then moving you know challenging you know the person so it's more of a philosophy as opposed to just a um, I'm going to get on the floor because with teenagers it's hanging out you know you got to go hang out and do what they're doing and uh, it's a little different so yeah I hope that helps a little bit yeah thank you for adding that additional information great and Doreen hi it's so good to see you guys yeah. um, I'm Doreen Hunt I'm an occupational therapist and also an ILS trainer um, been working with ILS, um, just teaching how to use the total focus system for about 10 years. And used to train with you, Joanne. Which is so you, fun. you trained me <laughs> in my journey of becoming an ILS instructor. Yeah, I'll never forget our first time together. It was fun. What? Um, and then because of that connection with ILS, the, um, the SSP came into my world um, back in the summer of 2016. So it's been four years now. Um, but my focus as an occupational therapist has always been, um, I'm, a, I'm a pediatric based therapist for most of my career, all of, I should say, all of my career until I started getting into sound therapy. And now I've included some adults, um, but it's more, not my main focus, but definitely in helping adults post-stroke, post-traumatic brain injury, and some with some trauma history as well but um my main focus is you know I, i'm an owner of a pediatric therapy clinic outside the seattle area mm -hmm. and doreen's being modest but doreen also does a lot of the q a sessions yes, uh, for the safe and sound protocol and is also on some of the new webinars that are coming out to talk about the new pathways which we'll mm -hmm. chat a little bit later about today um, the new pathways have not been released but uh, we're certainly starting the education process. So practitioners using the protocol know that that's coming and how they can start to envision that journey uh, mm -hmm. too. Um, so thank you. So I'm wondering if we could maybe go to, you know, so what do you think has been the biggest thing you have learned from starting to implement the Safe and Sound Protocol in, in each of your practice? Um, so maybe we'll just go back around where we sort of started and, and come back. So what about you, Kate? What do you, what do you think your, some of the biggest things that you've learned from your journey of adding the Safe and Sound Protocol? The power of the, the Safe and Sound Protocol. Um, you know, it, in the beginning, I, we, okay, we took it and we put people on it for the five hours. And especially I, I started mostly with children. Um, so we were doing at the time a um, adoption protocol study, and most of these kids had um, and did have some trauma in their history. Not all of them, but most of them had some significant trauma history. And um, we saw a better connection with their families. Um, you know, I'm a, so besides being a brain trainer, I have six children of my own and six grandkids, and I've been very busy in the adoption world for the past 30 years, um, as three of my children joined us that way. And and we also noticed that bonding is so, so very important. So anything that can increase bonding was important to me. So again, the Safe Sound Protocol was just amazing um, for that. We saw a lot of great lights. Um, we're also, we do a lot of the parent and child together and we really wanna make sure that that's a good bond and, it, and that, it, that it's, you're able to do it and the parent is ready because that's not always the case. Um, where we re recognized the power, though, was in some of our adult clients, um, and especially those that didn't think they had any trauma, that didn't think they, you know, oh, I didn't have any problem. They never went to therapy. They never had any, they were more coming for peak performance or, you know, something like, or more in that um, realm, and um, it kind of unlocked a lot of things for them. And that was scary for them. So again, being a little bit more cautious with our adults um, because of what somebody, what someone perceives as trauma and what someone doesn't perceive as trauma. The SSP seems to um, unlock the real, if that, if that mm -hmm. helps. Very cool. And Monica? 
Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll add on to what Kate was saying. I think people don't recognize um, trauma because I'm not a, a mental health therapist. However, so many of the kids had trauma in learning, right? And learning was traumatic for them and school and that learning environment. And I've been working um, in alternative education for a number of decades now. And what I became, it, we almost had to... Um, it had to decompress for a long time when they came because I would work in distance learning programs and kids who were sick and things. And what I found was that create that need for safety. And what I found with the SSP and to some degree with the focus is that um, it accelerates that process for the kids to start feeling safe again. And I totally agree that, you know, whenever possible now, I try and have the parent do it as well as the child because it makes such a difference. And then just with COVID and, and recently I started working with a couple of um, older adults, which um, I just asked that they always have a therapist that they also work with besides me. And um, I've just seen just how much that's really helped them. So I think this cornerstone of helping that autonomic nervous system regulate is so important and, and, and that also is a, what I call a bottom up approach as opposed to always a top down on anxiety because a lot of the kids that I work with have a lot of anxiety and I just haven't found they're able to talk their way out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of those bottom up strategies and SSP has been a, a really big, big boost to it. And like I said, I sometimes start my sessions with it. And again, I find agency very important. So them choosing this and it's, it's a much easier um, intervention than a lot of the other interventions. It's a good one to, for us to you know, have the safety and the sound and it really reduces the hyperacusis. And one that I didn't expect was improving reading. But again, because it improves the auditory channel, um, the fluency in the reading, we see nice jumps in that too. So lots of different ways, it's a lot, very powerful. I've been very excited about it. In two years, I would have never guessed two years ago that I would be saying um, that we could see this much change in you know, a short period of time. Mm. I didn't expect that. I just wanna jump in and please anyone who, you know, all of us, if, you know, this is like a nice little open, feel free to chat. So if somebody says something and you wanna add on to it, you know, please, we don't have to stay so <laughs> ordered, but, but Monica, I just wanna you know, say thank you so much for bringing up that a learning challenge can be a trauma to a particular nervous system yes. that, you know, often sort of people have in their mind trauma of, you know, a catastrophic event, you know, abuse, neglect, but a lot of our learning challenge children, children on the spectrum, ADHD, you know, their daily challenges of just going to school is creates a stressor and it's an element of trauma for them. So, um, so thank you. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else wanted to jump in on that. I would like to jump in one, one more. Because mm. again, with the trauma kids that we had when we went through, um, we were working with so many adopted children and we used a lot of sensory motor to really calm them. And we yep. were going through it. We were using it once, twice, two, four, five times they were going through sensory motor. This is a lot of listening. There was also a lot of trauma. What we saw with the SSP is that since we have implemented SSP, we've never had to go through sensory more than one, more than twice. We have had to use it twice, but we don't see this constant re having to repeat it because the SSP shortens that. Um, and I, the other thing is with the auditory system being weak, we see a lot of people with that have, have really weak auditory system. How I say it is that brain's not hearing what the ears are hearing when the ears are hearing it. It's my way of explaining it to people. But when you are trying to hear well and you have to, you're, you're in a lot of traumatic stress. It, it's not, you know, it's just like, it's, it's stressful. And that anxiety from that is dysregulating people's nervous system. And the SSP is very beneficial to get them to a better state. Mm -hmm. Right, nicely yeah. said. And I just to clarify for some people who aren't familiar with um, the sensory motor, sensory motor is, is one of our programs that are on the, the focus system. It's an air and bone conduction system. And Doreen, did you wanna? Yeah, and I would just, I, oh gosh, the biggest thing we've learned, we've learned so much that you can't even put into a small little statement here, but um, 
obviously I think as Kate said, the power of this program, you know, I've since using the ILS total focus programs um, have seen so much change in, um, you know, neuroplastic change in the, in the nervous system of individuals and to go from 60 hours of a sensory motor program to the shift that we were seeing with five hours of music was my first aha thought of, oh my gosh. And, um, and then also like we talk about so much where people, when we relate this to children with learning disabilities and the stresses that they live in, you know, that sympathetic state that they are just primed for because of the stressors of walking into that classroom or, you know, and, and that's equivalent to with adults that just have really stressful jobs or constant, you know, daily stress in their lives. And um, so again, it pulls me back to one of the biggest ahas is obviously does polyvagal theory and understanding how the autonomic state is so involved for me in sensory processing disorders. Um, you know, I trained at the Ayers Clinic, have been working with kids with sensory integration dysfunction my entire career. And to link traumas, and trauma, again, doesn't need to be, you know, a one-time occurrence. It can be this culmination of daily traumas. Um, but to link, you know, the tactile defensiveness that we see and the gravitational insecurity that we see in these other sensory, severe sensory sensitivities, um, to see them lessen through the SSP, through five hours of music has been just like a huge aha moment of pulling it back to, let's look back at the autonomic state um, and not just the sensory integration diagnosis or you know, sensory processing disorders. Um, and one more thing that was a huge aha, and I know I've told you about this, Joanne, was the bilateral motor coordination changes that I would see, the bilateral integration, right and left hemisphere communicating better, which also feeds right into what you're saying, Monica, with the reading. And we do see jumps in, in under, you know, especially receptive language first, <laughs> is what I and you know those language and um, so anyhow bilateral integration you know little kiddo I had two little kiddos that we had worked on pedaling a tricycle pedaling and steering a tricycle at the same time these were lower functioning kiddos with some real dysfunction and it was like you flip the switch on you know, from five hours of the SSP and I had been working on it for months using even the sensory motor program on these kiddos that was a shocker to me and, and just the rigid sometimes the um, the fear, the rigidity in taste, trying new things and trying new foods. That's another one that I was surprised at that all of a sudden parents were saying, you know, they, they tried something they never tried before or we're not having those big, you know, meltdowns first thing in the morning, right? Um, he's able to actually able to choose, you know, you know, something for breakfast from what I have as opposed to I only can have this you know, one thing. And so the families weren't walk, aren't walking on eggshells starting their day like that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we sometimes underestimate just the impact of see small changes in someone's life because mm -hmm. we can give them some predictability, right? And they now feel calm enough to be able to look a little bit further out, you know, with their thinking and that I can make a choice. You know, I have choices here. I don't have to be so rigidly. And when we get into fight and flight, that's what happens, right? We narrow down, narrow our choices. Our, our window of tolerance is much narrower. So anything we can do to expand that window of tolerance and that willingness, like for me, um, I've done a lot of, you know, reading tutoring over decades. I used to tell people, you know, half of my job is just getting them to try one more time, right? just that one more time because they've had so much failure in the past. And I think somehow the, what SSP does is it calms that nervous system. It also, you know, it does exercise that speedious muscle, right? So they obviously are hearing better too. So it, it's been amazing. Like I guess I would have not predicted this two years ago when I started mm -hmm. um, that I would have seen this much change. And Monica, I just want to jump in and add a little piece of, to add a point that you brought up in terms of, um, helps to create that shift where parents don't feel like they're walking around on eggshells. And that's what helps with that whole cos cascade of change. So then the parent's nervous system starts to actually calm down and relax. So, you know, 
talk about polyvagal and neuroception. So those cues yes. of safety start to return back to the child because the parent's nervous system is in a less defensive state. Mm -hmm. And that just helps to carry the changes ongoing um, over time. And, and I think well, it builds like, resilience. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. We did it again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. You go, Kate. Okay, I'll go. Um, connection. So what I see is better connection. When the, there's so much better, we do a lot with bonding. And again, um, the bonding between the parent and child, but we've also had um, married couples do it together. Mm, okay. And um, we, we've done that and we really see this aha and this calming and this kindness um, when they're better regulated. So we're getting... Um, families better connected. In fact, we've had families that do it if they're doing it together, like the, the father would do it, the dad would do it with one child one day that, you know, and then the moms will do it and they'll switch. And then the last day, the kids are doing it together and the parents are doing it together so that everyone is having this, the, you know, we're really getting a regulated family um, and um, more connection. And, you know, I've gotten such great responses where, you know, we have a happy household. Yes. And, we That's call it harmony, yeah. harmony in the household yes. <laughs> and, and co-regulation, which is that connection. Exactly. And it is really, I think every marriage and family therapist should be using the SSP first. And then mm -hmm. we're all open to listening. We're less um, annoyed with each other, you know, and I'll, I'll say it very personally. My husband and I do it together very regularly. I finally got him hooked on how it helps us. Definitely. And it, it actually, I was, I'm glad you went first, Kate, because I was just going to add on it. It actually, what I'm finding, and it's builds resilience. It's a key, it's one of the components for, for helping people develop resilience. And you still need someone to have your back and you need, you know, all kind of other things, but just helping your nervous system regulate a little bit more, it, it gives you that little bit of grace to develop resilience, to be able to bounce back because you know, you know, you're not stuck in in that fight or flight. And then I say that allows us then to use our strengths. And I'm a very firm believer in strength-based learning. And, but we can't access our prefrontal cortex when we're in fight and flight, you know, it just shuts down. So anything we can do to get that prefrontal cortex back online again is gonna help. And especially, you know, we, my husband and I, we've been married a long time, we always say we both can't be flipping our lids at the same time, right? <laughs> somebody, somebody has to be regulated, um, and it, it is—it's good when you have two partners in the family because we have three grown kids now. But there's, yeah, there are plenty of times, um, especially after my second son had gotten a car accident and he had a brain injury, and there were lots and lots of stressful times there initially, and. Um, Sometimes we'd have to say, I think, you know, exit stage left here because, you know, I'm not, I'm not too regulated here. So, yeah, it's amazing. And I think that's the other nice thing that the tool brings to us all is that it helps bring that polyvagal language that we can start to talk to our, our clients and, and the families. So then they start to, you know, use terms like flip your lid or understanding where their autonomic nervous system is at that stage so they can have those moments of, of pausing or observing behavior as, as, as an autonomic nervous system that's, that's dysregulated versus, uh, you know, a bratty child or, uh, um, you know, somebody deliberately being obstinate. So I think that's another nice mm -hmm. thing that this work brings. We don't have anyone, you know, the only thing we're cautioned about, especially with our adults about using the safe sound protocol, we don't let any, since, since we're not therapists and most of our trainer training is done is a home-based. Um, it's a very powerful um, program to, to have our clients use. So we are really cautious, especially with our adults and our parents. And um, we don't have them do the safe sound unless they have the ILS with them so that they can use the calming if they become dysregulated. Mm -hmm. And often we want them to get through, um, if they need sensory motor to get through, like to get through so many sessions of that to make sure if there's any dysregulations, we're aware of it and we can kind of troubleshoot before we give them something so powerful. Kate, can I ask a question? Do you ever use the, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that 
So say some a parent listens to day one, day two, and they're feeling dysregulated. Do you move them to the total focus calming music for a few days till they feel calmer? Do you that's mix the they, programs? We mix it. We never used to. We didn't do that at first, but that's something we've been adding because we didn't have any adverse reactions the first few years. So we weren't, we're like, wow, this is all we saw was positive. And then we saw a couple of negatives all in a row and they were ones that surprised us. They mm -hmm. weren't ones that I anticipated and it was because when you're talking with them, they, oh, it was, I didn't have any, I didn't have any problems. And then we, it, it unravels that there was a lot of dysfunction that got stopped mm -hmm. and they did, they did. So now if someone wants the SSP, if they have an ILS at home, I would prefer them to do the focus unit first to see if that to see how mm -hmm. that goes before I put them on the mm -hmm. SSP. I feel it's a safer way yeah. since I'm being a therapist. Um, if if they really want it, they have to of course be with a mental health provider. If I am in the any way um, concerned, um, mm -hmm. I. I don't have to worry about that if I've had them go through 30 sessions of I, of the focus unit because if yeah. there's any dysregulation, it's already going to come up. I'm going to know about it, um, mm -hmm. and 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 they'll work through more. So I'm just a little bit more cautious, and I like mm -hmm. um, that's just kind of the way we do it. And again, if it's a little dysregulation, just adding 15 minutes of the calming, um, which I think they're going to be having on. Um, you know, in the digital version. I think that's one of the things yeah. we're going to add to give that yeah. extra, you know, <laughs> and that's yeah. a really good tool. And we never thought about that before. Right. So have you ever, sorry to jump in, have you ever done like, um, had your clients do 10 or 30 minutes of the focus system um, calming program and then immediately after listen with the safe and sound protocol. So they kind of get that grounding from both the bone conduction and then listen to 30 minutes of the, uh, SSP? Have you done that like in an hour long listening session? I have not. Mm -hmm. We do the, we use the SS, if they're on the ILS, we usually stop to do the SSP. They only use the ILS calming in addition to the SSP if they become dysregulated. Gotcha. And then after they finish the SSP, we usually have people go on calming for a week or so before we put them back on a focus unit if they're using a focus unit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a couple of th thoughts that come through my mind is one, A, something I've been really working with other colleagues on and really excited to see what ILS has put together for the new intake, um, Unite ILS SSP intake form. I happen to have it here, but it's all in our like emails if you're an SSP um, practitioner. And so using that for some more data to give us those red flags when we're using it with parents of children, for example, or someone who, you know, we're not mental health counselors, all three of us, all four of us. And um, so to get more details for those red flags of making sure a certain parent does have um, counseling or, you know, some uh, mental health connection to um, help them be safe with our sound that we are bringing to this family. Um, and the other point, just to, while we'll get into the, the new pathways, but, um, you know, as you said, yeah, the calming music is going, is going to be on the app. However, typically we won't be using it with bone conduction headphones. It'll just be the music by itself without bone conduction headphones. But if you're not using a focus unit, that's all. It is still stronger to have the focus unit. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is, I'm sure. And, you know, mm -hmm. some of the things... I think that we do in the education piece now. I think the education piece, I'm an educator, so obviously, you know, I, I, I try to work, obviously learning into it, but I think that one of the things that we're learning about learning is the more reflection involved in the learning process, the more learning that goes on. And, and we used to think that was just with adults, but we now know it's with children. Right when that kid goes, yes, I did it. I mean, that's a reflection already. I mean, they they've acknowledged their own learning. So I've been doing more building in a little bit of how this works. Do you ever wonder how come this works? Do you ever wonder how come? I don't use like to use the word why too much because kids feel like they're put on the point. You know, it's almost sounding like you know, too little too teachery, right? Uh, but how come? And then we talk. I show them the picture of the the middle muscle, middle ear muscle. The stapedius. And actually one little girl said she was studying 
muscles and she brought it up to me. She said, do you know what the smallest muscle in our whole body is? I said, you won't believe this, but I do. She goes, you do? I said, yeah. And I even have a picture of it. We were doing it on Skype on Zoom and she was like, and so I showed her the picture and she was like, oh, that is so, cool. you know, she's like eight, you know? And, um, but it is that, that piece of understanding, you know, we build in some understanding. Um, and I think that that really helps parents and it helps children, it helps us. And I, I, there's somebody had it and I got it on Etsy, that little picture of the three kids that are stacked up, the happy one, the, and, and the kids really can relate right away with where they are. Right. And they, they come up with their own names. You know, that's my turtle, you know, <laughs> what is this one that's my, that's my, what does he call it? Because the other one is turtle. And then the body he likes when he feels really good, it says camel. And I think the middle one is his, the coyote that runs around all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, but a lot that, of pacing. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that kind of have so much energy and, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with it all. And, um, I do that when I do the picture of their body. I think that's from um, Trauma Through a Child's Eyes, Peter mm -hmm. Levine. Where do they feel it in their body? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we color it in or, um, but I think that that they don't have good interoception either, right? They don't even know. A lot of these kids don't know when they're hungry. They don't know when they're, they're just not having those experiences. And I found that improves a lot. Parents tell me mm -hmm. that they know when they're hungry now. They don't fight about putting a coat on when they're going outside. Mm -hmm. right they don't have they and the parents are learning also to say well what do you think do you think you need a coat outside right as opposed to you need to put your coat on now well what do you think and then they get the two-way thing going and the mm -hmm. kids are recognizing it so I think the education piece that we do with everybody I think really helps a lot and I think you're right and I think this is a good segue into you know how do you actually talk about the protocol to to families or, or to children. I'd love to see, because I know we have practitioners who, who will listen and sometimes a new practitioner when they're starting this journey of using an acoustic tool, kind of like, how do I, you know, first of all, I've got to kind of, how am I going to embed this in my practice? But then how do I actually start to talk to this, you know, to my clients? So I'd love to hear what you all have to share. Dorian, I'd say one thing, um, I just evaluated a kiddo to, or yesterday, but I always, especially if it's an evaluation that they've come in, I've already educated or felt like the SSP based on the history um, is going to be a good tool for them. Um, I always try to link with kids, their history and any kind of difficult birth history, ear infections, things that are a medical reason to say, oh, that's why these other things can be hard, you know, and take the blame away from them. It's not their fault. And so I know one thing is I always do that where, you know, I kind of tie that in. Wow, that was a really tough time your mom had, you know, or you had that first year of life and, and making sure they know that because they don't really know that unless someone's really talked to them about it. Um, but, and then moving into as we're doing the assessment, I'm doing a lot of auditory assessment and asking questions. That's how we move into how we can help their ears and make it be very, you know, low level of um, understanding, but try and, you know, talk about how, how amazing music can benefit us. And, you know, I bet you didn't know that. And talk about those two muscles, actually, Monica, the tensor tympani and the stapedius muscles and how important they are. And I always correlate them with the same, people always know what their pupils do but they don't know about these muscles. And I always am teaching about just like what the pupil does with letting in more light and getting larger when it's a darkened room, you know, these muscles need to relax when it's, when it's loud or when it's quiet sounds, but they need to tighten up when it's too much sound and their muscles don't work very well. You know, so turning it into something that's educational at a very easy level. Mm -hmm. I like that. Dory, that's, that's what we do as well. Um, the only little difference is that more than half of our clients are adults um, and they're coming for healthy aging or peak performance um, or they've had a concussion. We do a lot of concussion recovery. So why am I putting on safe sound when they're coming for healthy aging? So again, strengthening the ear muscles and, and, and as we age, don't just put on hearing aids, but let's strengthen how our auditory system um, you know, we work on, um, you know, 
we do an evaluation that's very thorough with their eye brain with it is there are their eyes teaming together and working together or their ears their cut we do a lot of cognition testing um, for our adults so this safe sound again if there's an auditory and if there's any stress related i think that this safe sound can be used for a lot more people because especially right now everyone's having stress so, you know, it's pretty easy right now to sell the safe sound protocol to anyone because everyone understands this is a stressful world. And, and, and I also would say something real quick. You talked about early on, Kate, that you didn't need to really titrate it. And five hours went pretty smoothly more frequently than it does now. And I think that speaks to the nervous systems that we are all living with, with um, yeah, what's going on in, in the world with COVID and et cetera in the United States. So <laughs> we won't go there. But anyhow, I think we are all in a different state where maybe that's why we're seeing a lot more over uh, responsiveness to the SFP and we need to slow it down. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just agree with you know what you both have said. And, and I think also just helping people understand that there's something they can do about this. This is not something that that is not changeable. That they can't. They can. There's there's a, there's hope there, right? There's a hope that there's some neuroplasticity. And you know, I, I love Norman Doidge's work. And I know I've just listened to another interview that he's done with um, Dr. Porges. And I think there's so much neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. and a lot of that information is not easily understood. So. I think one of the things I think we can do with SSP is, is deliver that information in a way people can hear it they can, and can understand it, right? And this isn't a major, major time commitment. And you know, that, I think that's the hardest part I had anytime I've done the focus is, is people staying committed to it you know, long enough to be able to see some results. And um, I've done other th sound therapies early, you know, early in the around the 2000s when my son was first hurt. And this is so much easier to do than some of the other ones that we had done before. Um, so I think that's, that's huge. And then I love the work of Stanley Rosen Rosenberg too, because, you know, just helping people understand that, you know, doing some of these simple resets really help. They're not hard. And I will do it with them while we're in that 15 or 20 minutes at the end, three sighs you know, three, three long exhales um, with kids, you know, we do all kind of, you know, elephant ones and, you know, you do all the fun stuff, but, um, but I think to your point, Kate, I think it takes brain gym to a whole new level. Cause we certainly, I've always done a lot of the, you know, crossing the midline and doing all those things back in the eighties. Cause I came of age when Gene Ayers just started, that kind of tells you how old I am, but you know, so her, she was also very influential and then she kind of went out of favor um, for a while there, but you know, you don't forget what you already know, right? And then when I had a premature baby, I got introduced to primitive reflexes and I went, whoa, I did, you know, you learn. So I think we have life experiences, then we have our professional experience. Mm -hmm. So I think when we can pull all of these things together, and I'm just loving the interplay between, you know, Stanley Rosenberg's work and cranial sacral and OTs, you guys have, you know, sense, sensory issues have been huge. And a lot of OTs, when I first started, did not know about them. You know, that was a very un, mm -hmm. uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. So many of these programs are needed so badly by people, but they're not known. Yeah. I started brain train on my dining room table, table help, and one of my kids um, recovered from a nine hour brain surgery. And another son recovered from, you know, multiple concussions. He was a college football player that couldn't drive for three years because of blackout. So they are, his recovery was featured in popular science magazine and he's now happily married and living in Austin. So, and my other one is, is it recovered as well, but traditional medicine didn't have these boys, these young men recover. Um, they had already tapped out of, they were already both discharged from neurology, but they weren't discharged where they could have a job or have a life, right. you know? And that's where the, the focus, the SSP, interactive metronome, lots of different programs that are out there can actually so, so help 
someone to reach new heights. And you don't have to have a nine hour brain surgery. You could just be a child that is just, you know, you know that there's something there or an adult. How many adults we have that have, they've, I've had multiple doctors that have worked with us that have got metal, you know, multiple degrees and there's, they have to work harder than, than um, the, the doctor next to them. They bring their charts home at night because it takes too long and they don't have time. Right. Right. So um, there's a lot we can do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when you sort of said getting it out there. I think that's where the work from Norman Deutsch has really helped to bring the understanding of neuroplasticity and the possibilities of that that can enable a little bit more into the public domain. Um, and then, you know, things like this where we can try and get the word out about the safe and sound protocol, but I think more so, not just the possibilities of what the protocol brings, but that deeper understanding of our autonomic nervous system, um, which really creates the base of, of, of a lot of the other interventions um, is, is important. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if we could, you know, we could talk about lots of different things, but I know we've got some new exciting sort of development, developments that sort of happening with the safe and sound protocol right now where, uh, where, where it can, can be delivered through a digital platform. And just wanted to see what you all have been experiencing through shifting from using the, the, the MP3 player to now delivering it through the, through the app. Um, so Doreen, did you wanna start there? Mm -hmm. Sure. Can I clarify? I'm understanding that it's not accessible to Australia yet on an app. Uh, in Australia, it's we've just launched it, so the trial is just starting. Mm -hmm. So good. it's going to be exciting. Good. Oh, nice. Good. Good. And I've had it for a little while um, since we're the, the distributors here, so I've had experience with it. But um, mm -hmm. but I know you all. You know, obviously we've been involved in seeing how it's been rolled out in the US, mm -hmm. but you all have had more experience implementing it. So yeah, I'd love to hear what you've noticed through doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just quickly say, I mean, I've, I've, I'm still doing 50-50. I'm still using the MP3 players as well. Um, just for me personally in the clinic, we've been using that because um, we have um, about 16 OT, PT and speech therapists that work in my clinic. And um, so I'm in the process for those who have multiple users in the clinic, I'm in the process of um, getting, you know, Bluetooth headphones and or, and those I've ordered, but I haven't decided between a tablet versus like getting an Android phone to have the device, to have it um, downloaded onto a device. So I'm in the process of kind of switching in the clinic. So we're using both, but for parents doing it at home, um, I definitely have had, friends and you know friends that I can share it with so I could practice as well just using the app that way and um, you know I've had a couple of friends colleagues those kinds of things that have done the SSP before and so that they understand it and then having them try the digital version that sort of thing and so um, yeah I mean it's wonderful to be able to really follow their listening habits what they've listened to if they're not doing it in clinic um, and seeing that on the dashboard and following that. And um, there's definitely, you know, quirks and things, you know, that we know ILS is aware of, some more notifications or things. So therapists, so clients that are listening at home, just to remind them to listen. Um, and for therapists, maybe a little reminder, so-and-so, you know, so we don't have to go in and check all of our clients that we've, we've got the program um, or we've given the, the app to just more notifications to make it be less time consuming. So there'll be definitely changes that'll continue to um, come with time, but it's an exciting transition for sure. And I think that's what's so nice about Unite ILS is that they're, they're listening to practitioners and listening to what they've, you know, what they're asking, what they feel will make the whole experience um, more streamlined, more successful, more supportive to clients. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the notifications is a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm I'm primarily only doing remote right now. I'm I have asthma, so I'm in one of those categories of people that you know needs to 
take extra precautions. <laughs> Kate's looking at me. Yes, you do. Yes, I go mm -hmm. to pneumonia very quickly. So, you know, that's not something that, um, so, you know, I've been very cautious, you know, in my bubble, but it enables me to still work. You know, I, I can still have eight, nine people still doing SSP, you know, and along with my private practice of working, you know, educational consulting and um, I can still do that and I can still help people. Um, I, I too, I tend still tend to start out the first couple days with them. You know, I do find that um, helping them make that adjustment to what I call the tin, you know, the, the tinier sound that, that it, sometimes people need a little bit more co-regulation. And so I tend to at least do the first hour with most of my clients, sometimes the first two hours and then, and some of the clients I do everything, you know, some of the kids and everything, we do it just as part of our, our sessions together. But I do find that having that time in the first couple of days, first couple of hours now, um, seems to help set the tone. And, mm -hmm. and I, I get better uh, cooperation, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, to finishing it mm -hmm. as opposed to just, and I have just done it the other way too sometime, but mm -hmm. I just find this a little bit easier. Anybody, I don't know. I know we had that conversation today when we were on the Q&A. So I was just uh -huh. curious if other people have other, mm -hmm. other experiences. It's, I was just gonna say, it's so variable. I called on a client that I evaluated yesterday and she did 10 minutes in the clinic with me after I finished her evaluation. She's a nine year old with like misophonia, really sensitive to mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. people eating around her and a lot of um, history of anxieties. and. The mom said she's been asking for more and mom was working. They were planning on starting Saturday. So tomorrow is the day to start, but she's been asking for more. She said, we came home from your clinic and she went upstairs and worked for several hours and did a whole and did all kinds of schoolwork. She's like, which has never happened. And that was with 10 minutes yesterday. That's, in the clinic. that's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. So I just wanted to add... Different. Yeah, and I just wanted to add for people who are listening to this for the first time, and just to add on a little bit to what Monica was saying. So being a practitioner who primarily works remotely, your ability to support clients using the Safe and Sound protocol would have been you would have shipped the equipment out, um, you know, waited to for you know the postal to deliver that, and then would have worked remotely with the client, you know, one client as they work through the if you only had one system and then would need for it to, once completed, be returned, and then you could then go on and work with somebody else. So that is the, uh, the beauty about the digital platform is that now you're able to, through um, a dashboard and through the delivery through the app, uh, able to, practitioners are able to help more clients with using the, the protocol, but still very much through the dashboard where you can visualize listening sessions very much be tuned into um, making sure what time your 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 clients listening, you know, how many pauses are possibly happening. So you have a little bit more information about their listening experience at home, and and can check in if you see that there's been like ten pauses in their in in their in their listening set in their listening session. So um, so it's definitely give um, a lot more possibilities, and and I know that unite when COVID hit, you know, the whole plan for the digital um, um, rollout was definitely um, part of their, their vision. Um, but with COVID hit, hitting that they, you know, saw the need and, and worked, were working like night and day to, to really make that happen. So practitioners like yourself, Monica, could, um, and with the US, you know, needing to work remotely, you know, had an opportunity to, to make a living and then to support clients who were, you know, you know, obviously under incredible increased stress demands because of COVID. So, you know, yes, the app is continuing to be updated and the digital platform will be continually built, but there's been, um, I'm not sure, you know, some people just think, you know, technology is a little app and something sort of simple, but the amount of work that had to go in on the back end just to build this, um, and to make it stream as streamlined as what it is right now um, is being excessive. And, a work. Yeah, a lot of a lot of work, and 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 the ILS Unite team it's it's a hundred percent been they wanted to support practitioners in helping to help their clients. Um, so I just wanted to to 
to let people know that it's it's a very challenging process to make this 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 happen. I wanted to chime in. One thing that I really like about the digital platform is the be able the ability to be able to do boosters for our clients. Yes. So we used to have clients that would come in and would need um, 30 minutes of SSP every week. They'd, they'd do the program like every three months, but in order to really feel calm, they, they needed those boosters. And if I rented it out, I would have to rent out a whole unit and then and get it back. And if so being remote for most of our clients now, just being able mm -hmm. to have them do 5A today that, you know, that we can add those boosters easily to a lot of clients that might need it more has been a huge, huge benefit. And that's one of the most exciting things I feel as mm -hmm. with the digital. I so, agree, Karen. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. Kate, I agree. Mm -hmm. It's it's such to have that flexibility now to really personalize it to fit the needs mm -hmm. of the person. Um, I felt the pressure always of needing to get the equipment back. And I would definitely rent it for at least 10 days because I didn't feel like they could get it. You know, I didn't want that much pressure on them or me. And so that just meant, you know, I could do it at best three times a month. Right. Unless right. I was and then the other is waiting lists and stuff for yeah. special for certain weeks. And now you don't have to worry about that. You know, right. It's, it's so much easier for our clients. Um, it's so much easier, I think, especially with the remote when you're in the office. Um, you know, I think, you know, we do have, um, we're, we're going to digital for, for all of it. We just, we just sent back our last unit um, just because the digital is working for us so well. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Yeah. Actually, and then since I've got you all here, I was just curious about is talking about you said boosters, and um, and I know Doreen, you and I have talked in the past, and you've had one particular client that I think you presented about at the SSP gathering. That was uh -huh. a very very complex child, and the mum was like, "I wish we could do this every day because uh -huh. of how much it." brought that child's nervous system on, on online and which is curious have now that with the digital have you explored um, using the SSP quite different from how we've all been taught how to use it and running through those 10 hours were you actually doing a long-term um, weekly listening program with them almost like a focus system have you if either of you explored that so I'd say only because of the what was called the SSP light during sort of the trial period that allowed us to have that ongoing for some clients for sure. Um, and especially in the pediatric world, it's been really helpful um, with, you know, having it just playing over a Bluetooth speaker, like even while the child's doing their homeschool work. Um, I have a little girl that she would just take the, the speaker and put it in her basket on her bike and ride around the backyard. And um, she had one day that she preferred and she'd play that playlist every day. And so it was very calming and safe, helping her feel safe. And so I'm you know, really excited more with, um, to feel safer with ongoing, having the version which is going to be um, released. We've been told next week, either Monday or Tuesday is what I heard this morning. Um, but is it okay to kind of talk about that flow right now with this well, question? Well, just, just no. before we, yeah. we move on to um, talking about the new release, I just, does um, Kate or Monica, have you all explored that option of using our SSP core um, for a little bit more like weekly, almost like a focus system listening protocol? I, I'll jump in. I actually do that with um, a couple three of the kids right now. It, that's just how we do it. We just have decided that every, we, we meet once or twice a week and I just make that a part of our sessions just because just it's a little too hard for them to make sure they can get with their, you know, I, I, that I can make sure they're getting the co-regulation. So this will be a long-term project. I mean, we're going 15 minutes, but we're still, we're seeing really nice uh, changes. I, I snapped a photo of um, the kid and you can just see his face. I mean, it's face, he has ASD, and his face isn't flat. It's got, you know, it, it has definition. His eyes are wide awake, you know. So I, I know it makes a difference. And he's actually, for the first time, able to make some choices about some next steps where that 
didn't always happen before. You know, he would get stuck. So yeah, I've done boosters. I do it myself. I do three, four, and five um, myself. A couple every couple three months, I find it. I do it with my family. You know, I do it on my pets. Uh, so I like the booster a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I I'm going to explore some of the other options, but I do like to get everybody through the whole first five hours the first time. Um, I haven't done any. I haven't change that at all. I usually like to get the first five hours all the way and then make some adjustments. I may change over time, but right now that seems to be working. Mm -hmm. What about yourself, Kate? Have like, you done any long, long term sort of like ongoing listening with anyone using the focus call? I mean, yes. the um, SSP yes. call? SSP. We've done a lot. Um, and we don't, we don't use it in exchange of the, of the focus. Um, we see them as very different tools. Um, there is some overlap, of course, but um, you know those that need the SSP boosters. I've had quite a few clients that have been even when we had what even when it wasn't digital would do boosters a couple times a month to every week for one or two clients, and that went on long term. I think I did one client an SSP booster for a year every week. Every oh. three months he did the whole program, and every week I had to do thirty minutes. This was a very dysregulated. Um, a young boy um, and it was absolutely it really held them out for the week and they drove um, you know an hour each way to get that half hour booster because I couldn't rent it out for half an hour a, 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 a day and I didn't want them to have it in their home for a week it, not not money being the issue is that they would overdo it right. and I was concerned with that whereas with the digital I can see that it's just being used for 30 minutes because I don't feel comfortable. And I told them, I'm not allowed to have it in your home that often. So you have to come here. Now I can say you can do it 30 minutes at home. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think that the SSP, for those that need the, the, the ILS focus, we look at it more for, we've got an incredible boost in um, visual tracking with the focus unit. We've got a lot of healing with our concussion. We've got a lot of auditory improvement um, that the focus brings that the SSP isn't targeted for. So they're, they're, they are very, they work so well together, but they are two very yeah. distinct programs. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you well, for that. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. So Doreen, I was wondering if you could talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit and share about the, the other new development that's happening in terms of the additional programs that are being added mm -hmm. to help support the, um, the SSP core. Right. So yeah, so they now are calling it really like three pathways. Um, and the SSP core that we've known and loved that is still like the rock, you know, and the biggest neural exercise that we can provide. Um, and think of that as being central in these three journeys or these three um, different options that we now will have. And so be, um, another one's called the SSP Connect. And that's really just the playlists of the music unfiltered. So the adult five hours of music or the child five hours of music unfiltered and which really could be um, utilized and it's called the connect to really think about developing that safe relationship first. Um, some people will be triggered by certain memories from songs um, or triggered or just uncomfortable from like we said, day one and day two is so extremely filtered. It sounds more tinny. It's if you've got a severe auditory processing deficit, um, it's hard to even, you know, probably recognize some of those songs or be tuned into them because it, it's harder to understand um, if you have some difficulties, so especially with kids. From my perspective, with language and learning disorders, I, we've we've talked about we wish we had the full playlist so that they could get used to the songs, get used to the full the music with full spectrum, and then move into the more extremely filter filtration of the SSP core. Um, so the SSP Connect has the adult playlist and the child playlist unfiltered, as I said, and it also has this third option they've put on there that is the classical music. It's the calming music that's from the Total Focus and just five hours of it. So there's also that choice that can be um, used digitally. So that's really exciting, kind of three options with the SSP Connect. Then we have the SSP Core, and then um, we have what's called the SSP Balance. So thinking about maybe 
maybe using it after the SSP core. There's been so, there's so often where people really want more. They're, they're disappointed when five hours is done. Um, they love how they feel. Can I, can I do a little bit more? And that's where we've, you know, added the boosters sometimes repeating day three, four, and five to make it an eight day protocol um, sometimes, or doing those boosts where I definitely do a half hour of the SSP core, like in their sessions once a week. Um, but I, the SSP connect, I'm sorry, the SSP balance, which is, was called the SSP light in some of the early, um, just trial use with it. It is less filtered. It's filtered with the frequency envelope that um, the voices never go away. There's always that connection to the person singing the, the voice of the, um, in the music. And so, you know, less filtration should be less in, is less intense, um, but we need to be really careful that during those trials, even though it was called the light, there were many people that said, this is not light. This is definitely having a lot of influence on my clients and we need to go slowly still, even with this at this level. Um, but it's still going to be a version that should be easier to tolerate. And it might be something, you know, we've got three programs um, that will be at our fingertips on the app, but there's different a variety of ways we're going to be able, we're going to need to trial and trial and use your clinical judgment with. Some people might really benefit from that SSP balanced first because it's more lightly filtered um, before they go to the core. Um, some people might go straight to the core and not need the SSP connect or balance. Um, so we're not saying they have to be in that order of ABC. It's going to be dependent upon what your client um, client's needs are. And we all need to do a lot of data keeping so we get some more stories. It's kind of a new journey again that they can mm -hmm. learn from. I think what I like about the um, what the SSP connect brings is a time period that you add that psycho edge component where you can build in the learning around polyvagal, understanding your own autonomic nervous system, the social engagement system, um, you know, helping, you know, yeah, build the, and building some of those other skill sets of either breath work or uh, where, whatever else is in, in your toolbox to help support them being successful um, as they will go through SSP core. And, and the only other thing that I wanted to add about, you know, some people listening might be thinking, well, the unfiltered music, I mean, I can just listen to anything. But when you read Porger's original study, um, they had three control groups and one a group of participants came in and just had headphones on. There was no acoustic information whatsoever. The second group had the unfiltered version of the music. And then the third had the, the filtered music. And so when they do this statistical analysis, uh, both um, unfiltered music and filtered music participants improved in comparison to just wearing the headphones, but there was a, an improved statistical um, difference in the filter group compared to just the music. But so you get a therapeutic uh, outcome exactly. through listening through music through headphones. And, and in my study, I've exactly seen the same that um, in my study, I replicated a component of Dr. Porter's study where uh, my control group had, you know, had the unfiltered version, the exact same experience in coming in with their parent listening to the music um, and then the active intervention. And I see improvements um, across my measures in, in, the, in the control group. So there is something very therapeutic in listening to headphones. And then when we layer in everything we know about polyvagal, helping um, the safe person be a safe person and create that connection that we're creating quite a lot of possibility during that SSP Connect time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exciting. Just our understanding of the need for connection. And, you know, we call it attachment and connection and bonding. That understanding, um, I think, needs to be, you know, I hope that message gets you know, spread widely, because I think that all of what we do in education, um, we don't spend enough time on the process of learning, on the process of connecting with the, the learner, the student, with each other. Um, and some of it we do automatically, right? 
we smile, we make eye contact. That's not always done. I mean, I remember going always when I was in the classroom, going to the back of the room to greet kids, right? As opposed to being in the front. And just mm -hmm. that, you know, and I worked with engineers and I found that was really the trick. So if I wanted to get good reviews, you had to say hello to everybody <laughs> when they came in. But those, those connections are so important because back then I didn't know what I was doing. I was creating safety. I was making mm -hmm. it safe to, to, and I was doing writing, you know, and I really didn't like people critiquing their writing, right? So <laughs> it was real important for them to feel that safety. So these, all these are tools in our toolbox mm -hmm. to help all of us be in, um, States More grounded. Can, grounded, like yes, that. absolutely. I love that word, grounded. Mm -hmm. And I think that Dr. Paul just says it's like a neurobiology, neurobiological imperative neurobiology. that we have connection. Yeah, so it does, it does lay the foundation. And I, and I think though the biggest thing to remember is like how much we've all been tuned into therapeutic use of self. Mm -hmm. But the SSP is so powerful for that neural regulation that, you know, we're looking at it, if it can cut six months off of psychotherapy sessions, you know, it's like, you know, instead of the person being a visitor on the couch for, and turn them into someone who is working and trying to heal and trying to change, um, you know, I just, it's so powerful. And, you know, yes, all those things that you're talking about, Monica, are so, so necessary but to speak of the changes that we all see in the power of the SSP that helps that individual nervous system and autonomic regulation change, um, it's, it's huge. It's been such a gift think, to us. I also think we have to think about the aging population. Healthy aging is, I, I think, very, very overlooked. Um, Alzheimer's is just growing so rapidly and it's, main, it's, and it's mo in most cases preventable. Um, and the the, the learning that the older um, individual has to do, the, the training that they can do, the neural connections they have to make, the feeling of safety that they need so that they can reach outside of that box. Um, I think um, we really have to look at that population as a, is sometimes overlooked in their new learning. Oh, 100% agree. Thank you so much for bringing that up. But you're right that, um, yeah, that we... You know, the brain is plastic throughout our lifespan. We can create those changes. Um, a lot of things, I think I remember coming across a paper that they saw that with hearing loss, that there's associated balance and um, degeneration in the cortex, you know, decrease. Yes. So, um, you know, I remember Dr. Minson saying mm -hmm. many years ago that, you know, sound is a nutrient to the brain. Obviously, you know, sound. you mm. healthy aging means I think the focus unit. So we have to exercise the muscles of the ear. We we don't want to put hearing aids and then further degenerate there. It just makes it worse. We need to exercise those muscles. We need to use what we have. And then if there's stress and anxiety and dysregulation, we need the SSP in addition. So those two components really need to be used with our um, as we as we age. And I think what's the beauty about the focus system is because you have that bone conduction component that really does help tap into our vestibular system, which does a lot with our yes. balance, our sense of body in space. Yeah. Are we say, I, just want to, I just want to say that we need to, I feel, put that population into that same basket of going very slowly yes. um, and yes. being very cautious and careful. Um, I remember using the total focus on my dad. And, um, you know, it's interesting because back then he ended up getting very sick a few days into it. And I just think back of sometimes people's immune systems responses from the SSP. And I remember thinking, could I have caused this with music, you know, with my own father? And, um, and it wasn't any, like he got better, but it was just a matter of, I remember that at that time. And I think I now know more that it sure could have been that, you know, we need to just go slowly, but very beneficial, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we've known for a long time that music has been, I have friends who are music therapists and, and it's been so, they've, they've been working with the aging population, the Alzheimer population for a long time. I think this is just another tool it would be in their toolbox as well, because we've known that music really, they can, they're just, they're more alive. They're right there with you. And I've saw it with my own parents going through dementia too, that music was one way to relate even right up till the end. Mm -hmm.
And I think if they're reacting poorly, I do agree, Doreen, so much that we have to be slow with this population. But if there's more adverse reaction, it's, to me, it shows how much they do need it. We have to go slower. We have to be careful. But it's also an indication of a higher need for the intervention. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's convincing them to go slow mm -hmm. and that it will work, but, we, but it's okay to go slow. Yeah. Fast is always better. Mm -hmm. less, less is more isn't that what dr poor less is more and i love mm -hmm. that saying i think it's you know if you want to if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go with other people go slow mm -hmm. and i think that's um i know i just had a colleague called a couple of weeks ago and said she's not sure she wants to use the digital because she couldn't some parent went ahead and the kid was all dysregulated and i said well sometimes people you don't want people to have those kind of consequences, but sometimes they have to have that for them to understand less is more because that's not the message we give in in therapy. As not the, in educational therapy, that's certainly not the the message we've given over the years. Um, so I think this is a very different message, and um, some people need to hear it more than one time, right, <laughs> before they really get it. And um, so I haven't had anybody have a real, and I'm going to say I have not had a really dysregulated client. So some of you who have probably have more experience with that. I've been around lots of dysregulated kids and people doing working with on the ASD population, but not from not from SSP. So mm -hmm. keeping but my fingers crossed mm -hmm. on that one. I think those experiences are less so now because we definitely have learned that we titrate yeah. the input to the particular nervous system we're working with. Mm -hmm. So Excellent. I'm really aware of the time and this has just been amazing but I was wondering as we we move towards closing if there was any like last sort of closing thoughts or comments that you have and you can either direct it to you know a pra you know new practitioners or practitioners considering uh, learning about the second sound protocol or if you particularly want to address your thoughts to to families or individuals so Doreen did you want to start um, you know, I guess one thing that I always say, cause I, you know, right now we're doing one Q and A a week and, um, it's such a gift from ILS Unite to have this open discussion forum for your questions. Um, I just highly recommend that anybody seeing this, that they are aware that those Q and A's exist at no cost to just sign up and you can find them on the Facebook groups most easily because Ann Smith usually puts them on there. Um, or on the dashboard if under, you know, education, um, if you're doing digital SSP or on the, S, on the again, education on the ILS website. Um, but and again, Q&A is a geared wall for practitioners, Doreen? They're geared for practitioners, definitely. And there are different, I do one um, once a month typically. Right now they're weekly because of the introduction of the new um, pathways. And, um, but there are other practitioners that also do Q and A's, just not quite as frequently. And um, Liz Charles, who is a mental health practitioner, physician in England does one. So especially if you're a mental health counselor, sign up for Liz Charles talks and Q and A's. Um, we have an audiologist, Kavita Call and Marianne Kaminsky, a speech pathologist. The two of them do one together about every couple months. Um, so if you're a speech pathologist or audiologist, that's a great Q&A to sign up for and get your questions answered that might be directly related to that area. Um, and occasionally there's a few other random um, people that might you know, get scheduled for answering questions. So it's a great resource as well as we all really have a learning community on the different Facebook groups, yours included with these you know, amazing speakers that you get for us and you interview, Joanne. I love... I'm, I've been listening to Dr. Porges and you as I'm um, riding my exercise bike in the morning <laughs> lately. And so, you know, get into help, you know, hopefully people are using, that's how I use, love Facebook the most is just for my SSP community. Really appreciate yeah. it. I want to echo what Doreen was saying. Um, I find that the Q and A's do really helpful. And if you sign up and you can't go, if something happens, you know, a meeting runs over, you could listen to the recording because usually within about 48 hours, 72 hours, the recording's available. And I row, you know, or I walk and listen often. Um, but that's so helpful because 
what it does, I think, is just keeps keeps the information flowing, right? And you're you're thinking, and and I just like I know I'm probably sounding like a broken record. We're just re re recognizing the importance of reflection, that reflection after an experience, because what that does is that opens those neural pathways, and we're making those connections. You know, the old what fires together wires together, and sometimes I'll have an insight an hour or two after I've listened to it. Oh yeah. Or I recognize a pattern that I hadn't experienced yet, but somebody else has experienced. And, um, and the Facebook group is wonderful also. So I would encourage you know anybody to take advantage of these free trainings. There's not a lot of free trainings around. So, and I really do appreciate learning from other people. It's so helpful. And I think what you said too, it helps build that community where you feel connected yes. to somebody else you know, with a similar sort of mindset and practice approach. Mm -hmm. So Kate? Well, I think, sorry, Kate, before you say, I just, the community point, I just, it's amazing how Dr. Porges's whole feeling about social engagement and community is so number one important and look at what he's created. We've, we all have become friends through, you know, on the computer from around the world. And sometimes we haven't even met of these people except for on the computer and we feel like we know each other really well it's really been awesome pulling people together kate sorry i was going to add something totally different um it was more on for new providers or for parents or, or adults that are looking for um say sound or sound therapy um the focus unit you know this isn't medication um this is we're looking for permanent change in the brain um, I am not anti-medication. I think there's a wonderful place for it. It is good and it is needed, but the less medication, the better. And a lot of, we can get some real change in the perm some permanent change in the brain with these, with, with these programs. Um, again, with, for therapists, if the brain is healthy, they're going to do better with your therapy. <laughs> You, you know, when you're in psychotherapy and you're in a better spot, you're going to have better connection, better marriage counseling, better, you know, better regulation for your ADD, easier time learning, um, all of those things. And, you know, if you know, the auditory system is often overlooked, if the auditory system is weak, people, a lot of children are being over medicated. ADD is real and some need medication, but you cannot medicate your auditory system. You medicating the stress with all, I have an adult psychiatrist in our area now that whoever, whenever she has someone who has high anxiety, she wants me to do an evaluation for auditory because when their anxiety is so high, they, they may have an anxiety disorder, but if they have auditory as well, it's heightening it and can, you know, we can't medicate that part. So the, the safe sound protocol and, and the focus unit as well helps to give, bring such permanent, wonderful change um, so that whatever therapy, whatever education um, is needed, um, it works better. Mm -hmm. The brain that heals itself, right? I think, you know, anytime we can help brain and body, you know, your heal, I mean, it's not always it's healing. It's a different different concept than um, medicating it, right? So mm -hmm. I think when we can promote healing and wellness, I think this is really uh, the wellness piece that we're looking for. Exactly. Um, you know, they're grounded and they're well, and mm -hmm. um, we can see the changes. So yeah, I would second what Kate's saying too. It's so important. These are all these are all key pieces. And um, it's bringing all of us together. I love when we can watch technology bring people together as opposed to, you know, separate. So this is a, a wonderful tool. So we can all be grateful and, and feel fortunate to have uh, mm -hmm. stumbled upon it. And to offer it, yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to say to you all, thank, thank you. you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge and your caring and I can, you know, your passion for the tool <laughs> and passion for helping people. Uh, I think what we've talked about today is going to be so informative um, for practitioners and also for families or individuals listening. Great share. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Thank Joanne. You. Yeah. Good to see you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you'd like to learn more about the Safe and Sound Protocol in Australia and New Zealand, please contact Integrated Listening Australia. The website is integratedlistening.com.au 
And for the rest of the world, please contact Unite Integrated Listening at integratedlistening.com.